Wow, this is quite a group. And it's a group of people who are excited to hear one of the most talented, celebrated, soulful authors living today. And we were very fortunate. Oh, I'm Carly Hayden, Librarian of Congress. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I am a librarian, I love books, I love authors, and so I get a little fangirlish myself with certain authors, and this is one because I had the honor of um, appointing and uh, giving the award for the 2022 Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction to Jasmine Ward. And she was, and the festival, she wasn't able to make it. She was otherwise engaged, and you'll hear about that. But we are so delighted that she's here today, and I know that she's the one that you want to hear from. And so she is going to bless us, really, with some words, and I'm going to sit and listen and keep fangirling. <laughs> Desmond. make me cry at the beginning. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Um, thank y'all for spending a little time with me today. Thank you to Dr. Carla Hayden for her gift of leadership and direction. Thank you to Anya Crady, Clay Smith, Rob Gaspar, the Daniel A. P. Murray African American Cultural Association and Literary Initiatives, and everyone at the Library of Congress for doing the vital and necessary work of reco recollecting our American story. I am so grateful to you for all you do and so honored to be here. That said, I'll begin. My grandmother Dorothy was born in 1940, delivered by a midwife. She shared her mother's womb with a twin named Shirley Temple, who was stillborn. She did not survive her entry into this world. Baby Shirley, born of my great-grandmother Mary, arrived with a deep indentation in her forehead, and she never drew a breath. Later, my great-grandmother Mary said she felt guilty for her baby's death. Mary had worked hard through her pregnancy, scrubbing and washing and weeding and harvesting, and once, she said, she picked up a metal tub full of washed clothes, heavy with water, and the rim hit her pregnant belly. When my great-grandmother saw the indentation on the infant's forehead, she thought, my fault. Shirley was buried in a shoebox in a segregated graveyard under live oaks on a bayou. My great-grandmother Mary was so despondent at the loss of her daughter, she shrugged off her surviving child, didn't even put my grandmother to her breast, and said, put Dorothy in the drawer. She's going to die, too. And then Mary turned her face to the wall in despair. But my grandmother Dorothy did not die. She fussed and stirred and cried in the chest of drawers in her makeshift crib. She grew up, rose stout and roped with muscle, eating beans and rice day in and out, weeding and pulling vegetables in her father's fields. When she was a grown woman, she could work like a man. She was five foot three and could pick up a whole hog and throw it over her shoulders. By the time I came along in 1977, my grandmother had worked as a housekeeper, a health aide at an elder care facility, a hairdresser, a seamstress, and finally, as a worker in a pharmaceutical bottling plant. But my grandmother Dorothy was more than her labor. My Dorothy was a storyteller. When our family gathered, she told us the story of her birth, her gold tooth gleaming. She told us about her toil in the fields. She told us about how she stopped schooling in the seventh grade because she had to walk to school, and the black secondary school in the next town over was too far away for her feet to carry her. She told us about how her father, my great-grandfather, was half white, and when she visited her grandmother's white sister in the sundown town next door, they left before dark, 
and she and her brown-skinned siblings hid in the boot of the car. She told us about throwing hogs, about doing hair, about sewing herself the most beautiful dresses and wearing the Tatina and Ike Turner concerts and whirling on the floor, whirling, turning so fast she grew dizzy, but she was so alive. She told these stories with a glass of Ice Jack Daniels in one hand and me in the other. Her chest was soft and smelled like jasmine perfume. I called her Mama. My Dorothy was the first storyteller of my life. One of the most important lessons she taught me about life and story was this. Tell it straight. Tell it all. Talk about the indentation in the baby's head, about how that velvet-skinned infant slid out blue, but tell the tale of her sister, too. Talk about how she fisted the air and kicked, soft and gasping, in the dresser drawer. When you tell the story of the childhood visits to the white auntie, talk about the dense, gasoline-infused trunk, the fish-hook jerk of terror in a child's neck at every other car's headlight, at every fire burning in the distance. But also, talk about how those same children played in the dirt when they weren't working or schooling, how those same children spun games out of thin air where they competed one with the other to create the prettiest, best decorated grave how they made crucifixes from oak twigs, crafted flowers from pine needles, how showing love to the dead meant winning, how my grandmother knew from childhood that love and loss were twins in life, how beauty and sorrow kept company, but you could rest joy from the pairing. Sometimes I wish I could write easier stories, stories where generational trauma doesn't haunt teenage boys. Stories where hurricanes don't bear down on teenage girls and rays. Stories where brothers don't die. Stories where 13-year-olds aren't re-enslaved in parchment prison. Stories where enslaved people are born free and die free. A part of me would like to write only the good. Teenage boys leaping from bridges into rivers, yelping with joy. Girls cuddling pit bull puppies. 13-year-old boys flashing smiles over their birthday cakes, gleaming with happiness in the buttery glow of the candles. Sometimes I would like to write stories about worlds that never knew enslavement, smoke houses burning over a pit, rape, or hogsheads. Sometimes I would like to write stories about brothers and beloveds living forever and ever. Ah, yeah, yeah, my Dorothy said. Tell it. Tell it again, we asked her. Tell it again. So I do as she did, and I do it again. I shoulder past accusations of trauma porn, of trying to make people feel bad about themselves and history of exploiting poverty, of gross exaggeration, and I tell this American story. I tell this Southern Gothic, this Mississippi tale. I write toward what hurts. I write toward the truth, and I tell it again. I scribe the whole. Once, I sat on my grandmother's screened-in porch, the night pulled close around us, bugs trilling and hurling themselves at the screen, and the smell of her boiling pot, which she had piled deep with red beans and sausage and bay leaves and onion. If it was up to me, my grandmother said, I would never eat beans again. Was all we ate when we was coming up, beans and rice. Every day, didn't have no sausage in it, just a little salt meat to give it some flavor. But we was poor, and that's all we had. But I can eat them if I have to. I know how to make food stretch, how to make it with a little bit of nothing. She stirred the pot, and I knew the truth of what she said. Knew she baked golden crusted pound cakes thick with real butter, stuffed crabs with breadcrumbs and seasoned and herbs, boiled giant pots of gumbo as testament, as twin to her bean poor past, so she could say, I can eat good too. My life don't have to be all hunger and silty beans. This is life too. In part, I tell it straight because my grandmother no longer can. The reason I'm speaking of my grandmother in the past tense is not because she is dead. It is because my grandmother is losing her memory. The first story storyteller of my life is losing her stories. She suffers from Alzheimer's. Her memories have receded in a great tide retreating from the shore of her present life. First, she lost her most recent memories. Then she forgot her great-grandchildren than her grandchildren, and now most days, she does not recognize her children. She does not talk much either. Instead, this woman who always told the best tales, always jolted laughter from her audience or rapt attention while spinning story after story, telling us about how she caught her kids cussing in their clubhouse so she unhooked their rigged electricity, 
or how she sent her daughter to the local white elementary school in the 60s to desegregate it is quiet. Her mouth is sealed and still. Her face is most often slack as she stares off into what she can remember of the world around her, into what she can remember of her past. She seems disoriented. I wonder if she snags on moments in her mind, rocky promontories of memory, her seeing the downy faces and black eyes of each of her seven children after they were born, her taking her GED exam as a young adult and feeling so relieved and elated when she passed to qualify for her job at that pharmaceutical bottling plant, how it felt to sit on the porch with her mother and peel pecans or shell peas or snap beans and listen to her mother tell her own stories. My Dorothy has taught me what it means to lose memory of self, how it cleaves you from your life and those you love, casting you adrift on space and time, how it hollows out not only yourself, but the lives of those you love, of those who love you, how it sets them scrambling to hold on to the stories you told them, how it makes them grieve the stories that were lost. Once my grandmother told me that of her siblings who lived in Mississippi, only she knew the story of how her parents met. And for whatever reason, she did not tell me that story on that day. At that time, it was a tease. Now, it is a barb. My grandmother was from a long line of story keepers and tale tellers, part of a lineage of American greats who remembered the truth of who we were and what we'd been through and passed it along. I don't know if she ever knew how important her storytelling was to me, to her family, or to her community. How else would I have learned about sundown towns if she hadn't told me about her hiding in the trunk of her father's car as they fled the area called the kiln before the setting sun? How else would I have learned about how one goes about surviving generational poverty if she hadn't told me about the grinding work of resting food from the earth and sewing dresses from empty feed sacks? How else would I have learned about racially motivated violence except through her telling me how her grandfather had been shot and killed by revenue agents and left in the Piney Woods and not one of that group of white men who killed him had ever been held accountable for his murder? I never learned these facts in school. I didn't read about growing up black and poor in Mississippi until I sought out Richard Wright's Black Boy and Ann Moody's coming of age in Mississippi in high school. I knew practically nothing of American chattel slavery until I read Alex Haley's Roots in my senior year. I didn't read Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Are Watching God until I was an undergraduate in college, and I didn't encounter any of James Baldwin's essays until I was in graduate school. I knew nothing of enslaved resistance until I read Sylviane Diouf's Slavery's Exiles well into my adulthood. I have spent my life actively seeking out these stories. I took the tales my grandmother told me and I aligned them with what I read and it was the only way I began to understand the whole truth of American history. This is how I began to understand the truth of the life I had lived, the truth of my grandmother's stillborn sister and my murdered great-great-grandfather and my mother's experience in a segregated school and my brother's death, how history lived with us, echoing through our lives in terrible ways. This is how I began to understand Mississippi. This is how I began to understand America. How could I not honor this truth in writing? How could I not translate this knowing into characters and stories and place? To witness someone in all their complexity and to detail that complexity is an act of love. It means a commitment to sitting and grounding oneself in the smallest, heartbreaking, most wondrous moments and carrying the memory of those forward. It means jumping out of the windows of your car as it is being swept away by a hurricane storm surge, your pregnant sister at your side, your grandmother standing on high and dry land, her silver hair a beacon in the gray haze of rain, the wind crackling and rending trees, and witnessing the way she spread her arms wide, beckoning us to her, saying, come, I will keep you safe, her feet ankle deep in the water, even though she must have been terrified because she couldn't swim. It means grabbing your dying partner's pinky finger and caressing the fine downy black hairs as the heat of life leaves him. It means riding in the passenger seat of your brother's car and listening to music with him and listening to him speak in the quiet spaces between songs, speak about your parent, our parents and our siblings and his fears and what he wanted to do with his life, imagining you are both safe, that you have thousands of tomorrows when you only have hundreds and each drive is one closer to the one where a drunk driver will kill him. Loving them is bearing witness and writing about it. 
Tell it, my grandmother Dorothy said. She understood that full witness was love. When my, when my great grandfather was diagnosed with cancer, he told my grandmother that he didn't want treatment. He was in his 90s and he didn't want to fight through chemo. He wanted to go home, be as comfortable as he could, and let the disease do to him what it would. So my grandmother took him home to the house he'd built for his family, and she set him up in a medical bed in the brightest southern-facing bedroom, and she and her sisters nursed their father until he died. This kind of witness is hard. It's part of the reason that I believe we see so many efforts to ban books in school libraries and classrooms. Many want to avert their gaze, muffle their own ears, erase truth from memory. They seek refuge in fantasy, in realities that don't exist, where daughters never watched their fathers die, where enslaved people learned valuable life skills in enslavement, where they are not living on stolen land, where trans and queer people don't exist, and where racial violence is a myth. I push back against this in all my work, because not only do I believe that witness is love, but I also believe that educating myself about and writing toward harder, more complicated truths helps me to be more mindful of the miracle of joy. I grew up poor. Most of the kids I knew grew up in multi-generational households by necessity. We lived with my grandmother for years, along with my aunts and uncles and their children. Sometime there were 14 of us living in that four-bedroom house. But the adults in my life made room for joy. Sometimes my mother would purchase small plastic kiddie pools that she would fill with water, and she would place these in my grandmother's front yard. There was no central air in the house, so to have access to swimming water was a mercy, especially in the heavy, humid Mississippi summers. I would spend hours floating in these kiddie pools, floating in that muddy, grass-strewn water after my siblings were done swimming, looking up at the sky, watching the clouds and the birds make their mysterious way across the blue expanse, noticing the way that sound was muffled when I was submerged, relishing the quiet, the, res the respite. On some extra lucky summer days, my grandmother, mother, father, aunts, uncles, and cousins would bundle up hot dogs and bread and lunch meat and drinks and coolers and join other families and extended cousins, all from families who have lived in my hometown, DeLille, for generations. And we would travel in a caravan five miles up the road to a public beach along the Wolf River, secreted deep in pine and birch, river birch trees. The sand was blinding white and the water a deep amber. Families set up tents, made a small makeshift village all along the beach, and we camped for the weekend. My grandmother helped dig a fire pit, and when I woke up in the chill blue dawn and stumbled to the low, clean burning fire, she was always there in the morning, stirring a pot of grits which bubbled over the flames. I would hug her hello and she would feed me, and then we would spend the rest of the day in the water, coming out to eat seared hot dogs or barbecue they cooked over the flames. How I would sit with my grandmother in the shallows, minnows nibbling at our toes. My grandmother held a drink in her hand, ringed by her sisters, all beautiful women with gold teeth and at least three piercings in each ear and a ring on every finger of their hands, laughing and talking with one another, the trees around us arching over, booming with insects, bristling with shade. What community, what joy, what a gift. Two summers after my storytelling grandmother's Alzheimer's diagnosis, I rented a house near the beach in the Florida panhandle. I think I was seeking joy. My mother and her sisters talked my grandmother into coming with us. She woke early in the mornings, pressed her clothes, long cool-out shorts and airy shirts, and made breakfast for us, biscuits with gravy, bacon, grits and eggs, while I wrote. In the bright afternoons, we sat on the concrete patio next to the neon blue swimming pool, so far removed from our beloved Wolf River. No fire pit in sight, no smoke and singed meat on the wind, no bathwater warm, amber currents. But in the shade of that cream stucco house, as I sat at my grandmother's side, the bond between us remained, an obdurate jewel. My grandmother said, I forget things. My memory's not so good anymore. I forget all the time. I'll walk into a room and forget why I walked into it. And then I understood that she knew that she was suffering from Alzheimer's, knew that she was ill, and to witness her quiet terror was a terrible, heartbreaking thing. And then I acted shamefully. I tried to assuage her by saying, I forget all the time too, mama. The subtext was this, you okay? You're not really suffering the way you think. 
I don't know if I told this lie to comfort myself or in a misguided attempt to comfort her, but she called me on it. She didn't let me avert my gaze or turn my face away. She grounded me in that lovely, terrible moment. She taught me, bear witness, tell it true. She said, no, I forget. And I nodded, chastened, squinting at the brash pool and then back up at my grandmother's high forehead, her brown eyes ringed by a bright Arctic blue. Mama, I said to myself, the unspoken word thick with love, shivering between us like sweet gum in a summer rainstorm. And then she told me stories, some she told me before and others she hadn't. She told me the story of her birth and her sister's birth again, widening the moment to tell of the wash basin, the deep groove on her sister's head, her mother's despair. But then she told me something else. I had a call on my face when I was born, she said. Back then, the midwives said that babies born with calls was special, that they had sight. She looked down at her lap, uncharacteristically shy and modest about this blessing she'd been born with. It's how I dream of fish and know someone's pregnant, or how I know when bad things is gonna happen. I dream them. I already knew this. She told me this story before, and once I'd even heard it from my mother, but hearing it in that moment made me aware of how even more terrible her illness was, how it would entail losing even more than I thought. Mama, I breathed, and I knew I would carry this moment forward into the rest of my life, into my work, my small hours with my mother and father and siblings and kids and partner, knew that my grandmother was teaching me her most important lesson, to be present to witness, to love. Earlier this summer, my mother actually told me a new story. In the months before my brother died, she'd had a recurring dream. In this dream, my mother drove across the Delil Bayou down a narrow road ringed by water and marsh grass. Her car swerved and crashed off that road, sinking into the water, and she died. The dream troubled her. It felt ominous, prescient, and strong. She told my grandmother about the dream, and my grandmother drew from what she'd learned about her call-born sight in her life and told my mother this. If you dream about something bad happening to you, most times that means it's about somebody close to you. And if the main person in the dream is a woman, that means it's going to happen to a man, and vice versa. My mother remembered this when the hospital called her, summoned her, told her it was about my brother. My mother remembered it with sinking dread when she walked into his hospital room and saw my brother bloodied and terribly still and learned that he'd been killed by a drunk driver while returning home from work. The drunk driver had hit my brother from behind and my brother had swerved off the road into an oak tree and a fire hydrant. My mother remembered the dream when the representative from the funeral home wheeled the gurney into my brother's hospital room and loaded him on it. This is hard, she huffed to see her son barely dead for the last time. This part is hard, she cursed. A car, a crash, a dream. My mother told me this story at a kitchen table 23 years after my brother's death. We sat with the deep sorrow of the tale, her words etching themselves into me, and it was then I knew this. I am not alone in this endeavor, to remember the dream, to tell the story, to carry it forward and forward through our lives, passing it from one to another. Remember this, we say. Know this, we say. This is the truth of it. This is the liquid silk brush of the river. This is the smoky hint of meat in the red beans. This is the down of the baby's cheeks, the small knots of their fists on your chest. This is how your brother was born blonde and grew to tower over you. This is how your 80-year-old great-grandmother picked strawberries faster than you, bent over the rows, easy with practice from years spent tending her family's farm plot, and how she laughed at, when, at you when you complained about your back hurting as you slowly filled your basket with red, ripe fruit, how she joked with you, you too young for your back to hurt like that. This is how warm your dead beloved's arm felt under your hand as you walked beside him into sparkling, dimly lit Mardi Gras balls, and how he told a joke at your table and you guffawed, breathless, and couldn't stop. This is your grandmother on the dance floor, waving her hands, laughing and dipping. This is your middle son, who wears his dead father's eyes in his face, so deep set and velvety and large that it hurts to look at him sometimes as he leans in for a kiss. This is your daughter, green bean tall, jiggling your newborn son you've had with your new partner on her lap. The baby babbles and blows spit bubbles and your daughter bends towards you, into you, her forehead on your shoulder saying, tell me, 
Tell me, please. I want the whole beautiful, horrible, messy tale. This is the story. Tell me. Tell me, please. Ay, 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 I say. Tell it. Thank you. I'm just saying that we needed this moment. It wasn't a wardrobe malfunction, so that's good. But it was a necessary moment because I, I was very fortunate to get a copy of what you were going to say. And I remember talking with you, and some person said, oh, you should edit this. And I said, what? <laughs> You know, you read every word because it resonates so. And I was just sharing that, uh, and I'm going to share it with my mom, who's 91, going to be 92, and she felt the same way about bread pudding. I don't care how you put, fancy it up now. She's like, no, we had too much. So thank you for sharing every word with us. Thank you. And so your grandmother said, tell it straight. Yeah. So how are you telling it straight with also combining the fictional parts too? How do you do it? Um, I, I think it would, in all my, you know, my writing, right? So I've written a memoir, which is creative nonfiction. And so, um, you know, especially in that book, I wanted to be very honest, right, about, um, you know, about my family, about my community, about the people that I was writing about. Um, but I think that, you know, taking, I took my grandmother's lesson, you know, to tell it straight. And I not only remembered that when I was writing creative nonfiction, but I also brought that to my fiction, right? That command that, you know, that you should, tell it straight, tell all parts of it, include all of it, right? Um, and, and that's what I have uh, tried to do um, and tried to do it, I think, in a mindful way um, from my second novel onwards, right? I think that I didn't, I hadn't really uh, incorporated that lesson into my work with my first novel. Um, I think, you know, which is, a, book called Where the Line Bleeds. And I think, you know, because it was my first novel and I was just sort of learning how to write a book as I wrote it, um, I think that I, in that book, I loved the characters so much and they were such close reflections of, um, you know, the kind of kids that I grew up with, right? And pe people who I knew and loved that it was hard for me to tell it straight and to let bad things happen to them and to you know, just be honest about the kinds of lives um, that people who are like those characters, the kinds of lives that they live. And so that's a lesson I think that I learned um, between the writing of my first book and then the beginning of my second book, um, which is Salvage the Bones. Um, I was just like very aware when I was going into like writing the rough draft of Salvage the Bones that I couldn't avert my gaze, right? Like I, I had to write very honestly about um, what these characters would experience. Uh, and so I, you know, I just, I think carry that lesson forward and try to remember it in each of, you know, of, of my novels, right? That I have to, that, that, being honest in some ways, I think, is an expression of love in my fiction, right? Like being honest about 
the kind of you know, lives that Esh, or the kind of life that Esh might lead, lead being honest about the kind of life that Jojo um, might lead. So I just, you know, I, I, it's something that I just try to remember every step of the way, from the rough draft through to the multiple revisions. Is it emotional for you? It is. As you're going through it. It is, because I feel like, you know, I, so my, my family, my community, the place where I grew up, all of that inspires me to do what I do, right? And I think that at the root of that inspiration is love, right? I love the people that I come from. I love my family. I love my community. I love the place that I come from. Um, uh, so it's, it, it is difficult. Um, it's, and it can, you know, it, it can be an emotional uh, process, right? Where I, I think that when I, especially in writing the fir first, the rough draft um, of any of my novels, like I'm in it, I'm, I'm submerged in the world of the story. And so there are times when I'm writing that, um, you know, that I will feel, feel something of the emotion that the character is feeling sort of with them, right? Um, it, it was definitely difficult when I was writing my memoir um, and when I was writing about, you know, my brother's death, um, the deaths of, you know, uh, several friends and cousins of mine, right? And nearly every day I would cry at the same time, right, that I'm sort of typing and telling the story. Um, but I feel like it, it is difficult, but this is a commitment that I've made to, to the people I love and to this place that I come from, right, to do the work, right, and to write towards the truth. So I do what I have to do, I think. Now, that place that you come from, uh, you mentioned it's Delil. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Delil. <laughs> Delil is it's very small. Um, it only has around, two, I think, two, 2,000, 2,500. That's small. Right, people there. Um, Everyone knows everyone, right? Because it's so small. Yep. <laughs> um, it is situated on the back of a bayou. Uh, it is really beautiful. It's been settled for a long time. Um, originally, there was an indigenous native population there before um, the French arrived. Um, m my family, both sides of my family, like my mom's side and my dad's side, They've lived there for generations, uh, like as far back as we can trace. Um, and, and it's a, it, I live there now. Um, part of the reason that I chose to return um, as an adult was because I wanted to, to live and write in the place that inspired me, right? Amongst the people who inspired me. I think that I also knew that if I returned home, that being in that place with the people I was writing about would keep me honest, right? Because I felt like it would be very easy for me to move away and live in another place, right? And sort of slide into a dishonesty because, because I wasn't around the people who I'm, you know, who, who, I, who inspire me and who I'm writing about. And I wouldn't be, um, I think, present and witness to um, the reality of their lives, right? Um, and so that's one of the reasons that I decide, decided to move home and live there and work there as an adult. Some days, it's not so great. Because <laughs> uh, you are an adult now. Right, because I am an adult. Um, some days it's difficult. Um, 
but it's working right now. Now another, uh, and th that might not have been the town, but people might not know the history of uh, sundown towns. Right. When you mentioned that, it was like, oh yes. Mm -hmm. uh, what a, could you right. I, elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I didn't really know much about sundown towns until I was older, until I think I was in my 30s, right? That, that it was only then that, that I was able to put a name on, you know, this, to this story that my grandmother had told me, right, about hiding in the trunk. And I think the, perhaps the first time she told it to me, I didn't even realize that that's what was going on. Um, but I, get, I guess there's a, 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 a legacy in the United States of towns um, that were majority white, right, where they were very uh, vocal and adamant about not having black people or any people of color in those towns. And there were sometimes signs, I think, right? Um, but, you know, directives, like it was known that this, this, in this, you don't want, if you are a person of color, you do not want to be in this place after dark, right? And you cannot be in this place after dark. And if we find you in this place after dark, there is a threat of violence. Um, uh, and so that's what, for, I guess for my family, that's what the kiln was. Uh, but yeah, but I didn't learn specifically, uh, you know, that this was an American thing, right, until, until I was in my, my 30s. What do you feel about the fact you mentioned about you didn't know about this or you didn't know about that? You knew your family's history, but how it was interwoven with the broader history. Mm -hmm. Did you feel angry that you didn't know? Or? I did. I was very angry when I, you know, when I discovered that this wasn't just a, a DeLille thing, this wasn't a Kiln thing, this wasn't even just a Mississippi thing. This was one, an American phenomena, right? Um, I felt the same way when I learned that kids as young as 12 were sent to Parchman Prison in Mississippi in the early 1900s and, um, you know, basically re-enslaved for petty crimes, right? And so, I think, bothered by it that I felt that I had to write about it. And that's how that came to be, you know, that element of the story came to be in Sing Unburied Sing, right? Where I have this ghost of this child who was sent to Parchman Prison in the, in the early 1900s. Um, I, it, it bothers me every time that I learn something about American history that I did not know before, um, because I feel robbed, I think, right? Um, I feel duped. Um, I, so I have a new novel that is coming out um, this fall in October called Let Us Descend. And it follows an enslaved woman who sold south from the Carolinas and sent to the slave markets of New Orleans, right? And they were called slave pens, right? And that novel was born um, because I was listening to NPR one morning seven years ago, and I was, her, I was um, listening to a show where they were talking about the, the history of um, uh, the slave markets in New Orleans, right? And as I'm listening to the show, I'm realizing I know nothing about it any of this, right? I wasn't taught this in school. Um, and, and, you know, I spent a good number of my teenage years in New Orleans. My dad has family in New Orleans. I have family in New Orleans. But yet, this is something that has been completely erased from the landscape, right? Uh, sort of completely erased from memory in a way. And, um, and so in the, sh in the show, they were saying, uh, that at the times, this was seven years ago, that there, there were dozens of slave pens throughout the city of New Orleans, right? Yet, seven years ago, there were only two markers of where slave pens were, and one of them was in the wrong location, right? That's erasure, and that's in part, like, that's terrifying, um, but it also 
is disturbing and it also makes me angry. Um, and so when I heard this on the show, I thought, wait, I, I, all the suffering, right? All the human suffering, all the human lives that were impacted by this, right? By this, like, by the funnel of, <laughs> of, the, of the slave pens and the slave markets, all of that has been erased. And that's not right. And so I thought, what if I write about it? What if I bring it back? What if I push back against that erasure? And so that's part of what I think inspired my, my new work. And as I get older and as I develop and as I evolve as a writer, I feel like that has, that's informed my motivation to write more and more, right? This, this, uh, this uh, feeling that I have of wanting to push back against eraser. And, and to bring back um, into public consciousness these stories that have been, again, erased from our public consciousness. Now, you mentioned that you've been, I think you've said, accused of, what did you call it, uh, something porn? Oh, trauma porn. Trauma porn. Yes. Okay. <laughs> And as part of the, so people are what, uh, say, oh, don't bring that up. Right. It's too painful. Right. It's over. Right. Let's move on. Right. Is that what they're saying there? Yes. That, that, that is um, a criticism that I have heard about my work. Um, I've heard about my work multiple times, right? And, um, and, and I think, the, what is most heartbreaking about that criticism for me is when it comes from, it comes from outside of my community, but what is most heart, heartbreaking is when it comes from, from inside of my community, right? Um, you know, there's this dialogue that I've been privy to um, around especially like slave narratives, right? Um, or, or I guess narratives about enslaved people, right? Um, you know, people saying, oh, we don't, we don't want that, enough. We've had enough, right? Like, I don't, wanna, I don't want to read that. I don't want to experience that. I don't, wanna, um, I don't want to have to uh, engage with, with that, right? I, want, I, just, I just want happiness. I just want joy. I just want, you know, easy stories. Um, and there's nothing wrong with easy stories, right? There's nothing wrong with that desire. I, I love a good romance novel, right? Um, but I don't think that the presence of one should mean that you don't need the other, right? I think that they can coexist, and I think they should coexist, because I think when you shy away from the hard story, right, when you shy away from the trauma, when you disavow it, when you want to silence it, when you want to push it away from you, I think that that then makes it very easy for what is happening now in Florida to happen, for someone else to come in and say, well, this is the real story, right? Like, enslaved people, they benefited from being, from slavery, right? Taught them skills that they didn't have, right? They, they're rewriting the narrative. So it is, I feel like, you know, it's one of my responsibilities is to write towards that trauma, write towards that pain. I mean, it's not without, you know, joy. Like, I try to create a full picture, but part of creating that full picture is to engage with that trauma and make sure that I'm, like, writing towards the truth. And remember, uh, there's a lot of book lovers here that are in person and listening and viewing. I I think there's been a lot of trauma in literature before. Right. <laughs> Just saying. Right. Just saying. Uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, so I think there's some um, microphones here, and I think they're going to work. <laughs> because you uh, touched on so many things, and I think you could either come up uh, to the microphone but while we're waiting. Um, about the joy part. 
<laughs> your aunts and the you know, having fun mm -hmm. and all that. That comes through too. Yeah. Hi, I'm such a huge fan. I'm from Mississippi, so, you know, it resonates really deeply with me. But I was wondering if you could talk about the, like, magical realism and those elements in your stories. How much do you think it adds to the authenticity of life in Mississippi? Um, I, I hope that that element of my work, that sort of magical realism element. I, I hope that that does feel authentic, you know, to readers because I feel like, I don't know, growing up, it felt real to me, right? In Mississippi, in that landscape, in my community. Like there always seemed to be, I mean, just in my speech, right, I was talking about like my grandmother being born with the site and what that meant and, you know, and, and how that site maybe was passed down, um, you know, sort of like in my family. And, um, and, and I think, so not only I think there's that human element to it, but I also feel like there's um, sort of a... a magical presence in the landscape itself. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so, yeah, so I, like, I hope that that element of, of my work feels true to, um, to, the, to the place, right? Mm -hmm. um, and to people who are familiar with, with, uh, with Mississippi and just with the South in general. And I think, Honestly, like part of the reason I, I think that it's become such an important element in my work is because I, I think that I would, that I'm sort of writing the reality that I hope exists, right? Yeah. Like I, I hope that there are things beyond my understanding that are happening in the world. Um, you know, like I, yeah, like I hope that those things are true. Yeah. I think that I have to hope that they're true in, sometimes in order to, I don't know, in order to deal with the reality. Yeah. Mississippi. Thank you so much. We have time for two more questions and then you're going to be signing books. Too. Yes. So if uh, we have to cut off before that, you could, you'll, you'll answer. Mm -hmm. Hi, Ms. Ward. My Hi. name is Sophia. Um, I first encountered your work through Salvage the Bones, and I think the vast majority of people here were alive and remember mm -hmm. Katrina when it happened. Um, I was very young, so I have flashes from it, and I'm wondering how you hope younger readers and future generations will be able to find an access point for that work without that memory. Oh, huh. That's a great question. Um, I, I hope that the writing around Katrina in Salvage the Bones is like vivid enough and immersive enough to convey something of what that experience was like for you know, younger people who, like you said, like won't have that memory of what the, the storm um, was like and really, won't have a memory of what the immediate aftermath and like the country's response to the storm was. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, that's my hope for the work, that, that the writing in it is vivid enough to make it real, right, and to make it immersive um, for younger people. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you three, will get a special treat because you're going to get a chance to actually ask her your question over here <laughs> because what they're getting ready to do, and they're sending me all kinds of signals. <laughs> I mean, you should see it. It's not pretty. <laughs> not pretty. So look at them. Look at them. We got clipboards and everything. It's like they're going to pull our mics and it won't be okay. a mistake this time. <laughs> But before we go, I want to clear up one thing. Mm -hmm. How to pronounce your first name? <laughs> um, it's, it's Jasmine, even though it's not 
spelled with a Z, uh, but it's Jasmine. Okay, because we heard all kinds of variations right. and everything. <laughs> and also, if you could just share before we go the reason why uh, you uh, weren't able to attend was a really good reason. Yes, I have a little baby. He's eight months old today. So. Today is his birthday? Well, uh, yes. His sort of, kind of. Birthday, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And you three come on over here, and she'll be signing books, and we appreciate you so much. Thank you.